There is a nagging, unplumbed mystery about the sea, so fascinating, it seems a soul must be hidden there. In the distant geological past, the largest island in the Mediterranean, the legendary Thyrenis, was split by the sea into two parts, which we call Sardinia and Corsica. The land of that ancient continent sank beneath the waves, and the new seaway, constantly blasted by storms, became the Strait of Bonifacio. Here, the Mistral blows ever fiercer as it howls between the southern tip of Corsica and the northern point of Sardinia, almost as though millions of hands were churning the waves and the currents below. In the storm, luminous by night, livid by day, the horizon vanishes and the confines of the sea and sky dissolve in confusion. Just as the wedding feasts of ancient emperors were celebrated with a massive slaughter of victims, the immense marriage of air and water is likewise a feast accompanied by disasters. The Strait of Bonifacio was the unknown sea where Ulysses' ship was lost. It was the barrier that prevented the Phoenicians from continuing their voyage to the North Star, which these matchless navigators called the Phoenician Star. Shipwrecks are the symbol of man's inadequacy when challenged by the forces of nature. While the wooden parts of a ship are easily consumed by the sea, sometimes its metal plates are just recognizable beneath a blanket of seaweed sponges and barnacles. Here and there we can make out the familiar structures of a ship, the cylinders of some old machinery, modern in its day, and other rusting evidence of human enterprise. Some of the wrecks were lost forever, entirely covered by sand or sunk forever in the deep. Others defy the currents and raise their trees of metal into the water world sky. The sea commits actions like crimes, and all too often the disasters take man by surprise. On an April evening in 1865, the Mistral drove Alphonse Daudet to seek the shelter of an inlet on the Isle of Lavezzi. No more than bare rocks and a few bushes, but better than our old boat, where the waves rushed in as though they felt at home. The writer found himself on the spot of one of the cruelest dramas of the sea. He knew about the tragedy of the frigate Semillante and told the story to the world. It was in 1855, a French corvette sailing for the Crimea was wrecked off the rocky shores of Lavezzi. All the 50 cadets on board were saved and even enjoyed their adventure. Immediately after, the cadets joined a troop of 650 French soldiers and put to sea again on the frigate Semillante. Just outside the Strait of Bonifacio, the sailing ship plunged into a tremendous storm. Colossal waves reared up and swallowed the ship. The gale carried more water than air, and the land beyond the shore was white with salt. The semillant was smashed against the very same cliffs which had wrecked the 50 cadets. This time the wreck was fatal for all on board, men at arms and old sailors. 700 lives were lost. 
It was the 15th of February, 1855, towards midday. But in that fog and that storm, the noon tide was blacker than a wolf's throat. In the fury of the storm, the frigate had shot past Bonifacio. But from the town itself, propped up on the edge of cliffs that looked like a huge balcony of layered pastry, to watch the circus of the sea, nobody saw its shadow. The only witness to the wreck was a shepherd who spent the winters on Lavezzi. Today, the island's only inhabitants are descendants of his flock. Cannonballs salvaged from the sea and crosses made from the wreckage have found lodging in the city of the dead. Not far from that sad garden of peace in the depths of the sea, life thrives in an extraordinary marine reserve. Sea creatures don't need protection from the fury of the elements, only from the interference of man. The biggest creature living in the rocks under the sea is a fish whose survival on the Mediterranean coast is at risk. In the quiet waters of the reserve, the groupers drift as free as clouds across the underwater mountains. The grouper isn't interested in how big the sea is. Its world is a well-defined stretch of territory near the wreck or else the hollow it has chosen as a refuge. Whenever the grouper finds a home it likes, it takes possession and immediately stakes out its hunting grounds. It only gives the impression of a slow, sedentary sort of fish as it glides gracefully through the three-dimensional water world. Like an airship, it can stop at any depth. Its swimming bladder is actually a hydraulic system for regulating its floating power. It can row or break in the water, moving its side fins like the wings of a bird. The grouper, unlike most fish, has a very wide tail surface. Its particular curve allows it to dart forward suddenly. The first flick of its tail can be violent enough to resound through the water. Groupers can liven up their chocolate-colored skin with a great variety of markings, depending on their frame of mind or their desire for camouflage, while it waits for its prey or pauses on a carpet of sand so white that it lights up the water or when it settles on the seabed to digest a heavy meal, it can become very like one of its tropical cousins, Epinephalus, its scientific name, which covers many different species of groupers, comes from the Greek term meaning cloudy. The grouper's white color scheme also functions as a no-entry sign. An angry male displays its white livery to a rival who has just invaded its territory and swims out in menacing pursuit. When a breach of territorial rights ends in combat, the main weapon is the mouth, even though it isn't equipped with intimidating teeth. The intruder runs no real risk, only his dignity is wounded. Grouper fights are more of a tournament than a battle. Territory is a living space that many sea creatures defend with the same obstinacy of land animals. But for groupers, combats never have really serious consequences. The fight can be face to face, but is seldom ferocious. They jab at each other in turn, poised on their fins, 
but this is more of a reciprocal intimidation rather than a show of strength. Hiding places, territories, rivalries and hierarchies are all parts of a complex system evolved through millions and millions of years. And yet it remains a delicate balance. After confirming supremacy in the territory it rules, the grouper returns to its lair, confidently sliding through the narrow passages in the heart of the rock. Its home is in an ideal position. If it leaves it unguarded, even for a little while, the place would certainly be occupied by another grouper. A specimen weighing around 50 pounds can only be male. Groupers are hermaphrodites. At birth and through their early growth, they are female. They don't become male until they reach a weight of about 20 pounds at the age of 10 or 12 years. This is why it is essential to protect the larger groupers with their all-important role in reproducing the species. This placid animal, the silent messenger of a world where the first forms of life developed, is the favorite prey of underwater fishermen. Even grouper families living in the reserves are constantly threatened by poachers. The groupers are well adapted in the struggle with their environment but they are defenseless against man. The layer is more than a simple hole. The grouper glides through a labyrinth of tunnels and corridors. As soon as it can, it loves to turn and peer through the windows opening in the rock. Spending most of its life in a sunless world, it often can't resist the pleasure of a cruise through the open waters. However dominating its presence may be, the grouper isn't the only occupant of the rocky hollows. The galleries and deep crevices in the rock are a crowded condominium where many other sea creatures make their home. The submerged coastal rocks are like an enormous building with many floors and apartments. Surrounded by gardens of sponges and sea fans, the grouper's layers are decorated by nature, free of charge, by the silent work of living builders. The rock walls are draped with the multicolored velvet of colonies of organisms, all burning, feeding, and dying. Under the sea, animals may be confused with plants. Flowers have mouths, and worms and crustaceans live permanently clamped to the seabed. A giant, like the grouper, swims majestically aware that it is almost unbeatable. But it can also take fright because of a change in temperament, just like humans. Man has also followed the prompting of nature. Since the most remote periods, natural caves formed by erosion, known as taphony, have offered shelter to the peoples who lived around the shores of the Strait of Bonifacio. These rocks have been hollowed out through the centuries-old process of deterioration, which created heavy, compact crusts on the surfaces like icing while the interiors crumbled away. The mountains of both Sardinia and Corsica are dotted with taphony, 
which confirm the overall morphological identity of places once united in the legendary Thyrenis. Prehistoric man found refuge in these houses, hollowed and sculpted by nature, sometimes adding a stretch of wall with rows of granite blocks set in a rough earthen mortar. In the Middle Ages, these domus de llanas, or fairy houses, were converted to prisons. Today, some of them are normal dwellings. In the land where the breath of the Nuragi civilization can still be felt, it's not unusual to find a shepherd who will tell you that he was born in a house in the rock, with a pride which has deep roots in an ancient past. The people who lived in caves on the edge of the shores have left traces of their intimate connection with stone. Their dead rest in niches chiseled out with blades of flint and obsidian, or else they were laid in collective tombs whose significance remains for the most part a mystery. The tombs of giants, monoliths, driven into the rock like knife blades, surround a great stele with the false door, symbol of communication with the afterlife. This unreal army of giants in stone, shouldering the weight of 4,000 years of history, is mute evidence of a people who left behind a mighty and mysterious imprint of its culture. Erosion is a destructive phenomenon, and yet out of the chaos of the forces of nature emerge scenes in transformation, animal shapes, abstract sculptures, wind, rain, sun, frost and waves have been working together for thousands of years. On the shores of Galura, Ulysses met the Lestrigoni, known as bloodthirsty shepherds. Strong of arm, in number infinite, gigantic to the eye, they hurled their mighty boulders from the mountain. Not all the rocks have been rounded by wind and sea. Some are evidence of an intense activity in quarrying granite, which goes back to Roman times. Unfinished drums of columns, others completed and ready for shipment. Capitals and other architectural elements are still waiting for their unlikely voyage. It is as though a fiercer storm than the rest had held up the Roman galleys forever. On both sides of the Strait of Bonifacio, they worked on stones intended for demanding Roman builders, as well as for export to the markets of the Mediterranean. An inlet on Cape Testa in Sardinia is the work site where, according to ancient sources, some of the columns for the Pantheon first took shape. To cut the granite, wooden wedges were driven into small holes chipped with mallet and spike along a file of dots which marked the line where the stone was to be split. The wedges were sprayed with water and covered with wet rags. The swelling of the wood caused the block to split apart. Waves caressed the columns sculpted in the cliffs, effortlessly completing the laborious work of the Romans. The rise and fall of the tides produce violent currents in the strait. The sea becomes a huge river. Posidonius waft like grass blades. The small creatures of the reef are like flights of birds battling the wind. In deeper waters, a big grouper swims against the current, hardly moving at all. It may be more comfortable to support itself with one fin against the rock. Another grouper shelters in waters protected by a steep wall. Mm -hmm. 
there comes a moment which marks for all fish the beginning of the daily round. The light of dawn descends upon the depths, sending a tremor through innumerable shadows in the sea. Millions of mouths swarm across the underwater mountain in obedience to the first law of nature, ensure survival by the search for food. Although the sea offers the voracious sovereign of fish a vast choice of delicious seafoods, a cormorant has actually been found in the stomach of a grouper. Reflected in the morning sunshine, the rock fish look even more tempting. The groupers contribute to the formation of a robust and healthy sea community. A vast displacement is underway. The groupers have accepted other companions in their hunt for fish. A school of sea bream has arrived from distant waters. While groupers are not great swimmers and spend their lives close to home, sea bream travel long distances to seek new hunting grounds. This association of predators has never been filmed before. Under an attack on this scale, the small fish shelter in the crevices, adopting a defense system developed through the course of evolution. The survivors may think that they have got away with it, but there are no definitive victories in the sea. The bream and the groupers no longer present a threat, but now there is another fish which can easily continue the feast. The finless body of the moray is ideal for slithering into the openings of the rocks. At sunrise, new shadows sweep across the submerged mountain, the shadows of mollusks, who have been hunting through the night so they won't be seen by the groupers. Like underwater aeroplanes, the jet-propelled octopuses return from their night missions. The riskiest moment comes when they touch down on the sea floor. Like all the sea population, the octopus is also bound to pay tribute to the lords of the domain. Stone camouflage and a squirt of ink don't fool the grouper, flint-hearted taxmaster that imposes the heavy duty of natural selection. If one specimen's defense system functioned in every situation, then one species would have too great an advantage over the others. With its ability to inhale water in enormous quantities, the grouper swallows the octopus in one gulp using its mouth like a vacuum cleaner. The grouper always swallows its victims whole. Its teeth are for holding its prey, not for chewing. Tentacle tips wave from the grouper's gills, and like another Jonah, the octopus bids a last farewell to the free waters and life in the sea. We don't know how long a grouper lives. Its intelligence and behavior are still largely a mystery. The little universe of the reserve is a natural laboratory which could make a precious contribution to our knowledge. Groupers were always believed to be shy, solitary creatures, but in this community, they abandoned their caves to unite fin to fin, forming a real school of fish. 
These groupers show an unsuspected herding instinct, an aspiration towards authentic social life. They spend much time together, side by side, in perfect formation, like one great big family. If we have no means of explaining their behavior, it's not because they act irrationally. It's because we don't understand enough about their world. We would be underestimating the grouper if we thought them capable of no more than elementary behavior such as hunting for food, the defense of their home territory, and the instinct to reproduce. Not only are their perceptions more numerous and complex than ours, thanks to sense organs of a kind we have either lost or never possessed, but each of them has a distinct personality of its own. According to nature's design, each individual in this assembly lives a collective destiny in its own way. These huge inhabitants of the sea, wild and free, are not our brothers, nor are they our inferiors. They are another people, belonging to a world more ancient than ours. Like ourselves, a people caught in the web of time and life. Thanks to the grouper, a simple heap of rocks beneath the sea is transformed into a magic mountain. The future of these extraordinary creatures depends solely on the will of man. The Strait of Bonifacio, which has witnessed terrible shipwrecks, remains one of the places most dreaded by navigators. An international treaty has put a stop to the passage of oil tankers through the strait there could be no justification for the ongoing death threat to a sanctuary of nature. The coasts and islands where sea creatures can live without being exposed to danger get rarer and rarer. If the Mediterranean is safeguarded by the creation of nature reserves, it will respond generously by offering habitats no less splendid than those in the tropics. There is a project to expand the reserve that bridges Corsica and Sardinia. Every rocky coastline in the Mediterranean could come to resemble the grouper's mountain under the sea. 